everyone. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone here at the Strand for inviting us to come, and um, thank you for, for coming out to see us. Uh, so the idea for this book um, came about uh, maybe a year and a half ago when I was starting some new projects, but I was looking at this pile of hard drives from all the other three films, and it, I think it was it ended up being about 40 hard drives with all the kind of stuff that we didn't end up using uh, for the films. And the idea of all the conversations that, that we'd done um, you know, over the years for the three movies just kind of rotting away on those drives was uh, I just kind of drove me crazy. So the idea kind of came about to like, okay, what if we put them in, in a book? Um, what I was about to <laughs> um, uh, embark on, the 18 months of putting it together, was just sheer hell. Um, it's, it was much, much harder than I thought. One, one thing I was like, oh, it's about 100 hours of interviews. Like, how many pages do you think that is? Uh, I don't know. We just kind of guessed what it would be, maybe 400 pages. or I didn't have any actual um, you know, data. So it turned out to be closer to a thousand pages, uh, and then once we kind of did a little bit of um, smoothing out and taking out things that were uh, that kind of didn't work in print, maybe in the film we were looking and talking about something, and without seeing that something, it didn't quite translate. But anyway, we got it down to about 750 pages, which um, was uh, uh, yeah, again towards the, the the end of the process was just like killing me basically. But um, but it was so fun to finally get it. Uh, uh, finished and get it, you know, in my hands and and um, and read through it. And I think there's some, you know, some some really amazing thinking and stories from all the incredible people that have been in the films in there. So um, I'm I'm grateful to have some of them with us tonight to uh, to talk a little bit about the um, what they what they've been doing and what how design has been changing since the films have come out. And um, yeah, so I guess we can introduce our panelists first from the. Helvetica crew, Paula Scher from Pentagram, brilliant graphic designer. We also have a type designer, Tobias Frere Jones. From the Objectified <laughs> movie, Mr. David Stoll from Smart Design. And Karim Rashid, ladies and gentlemen, Karim Rashid. <laughs> and finally, representing Urbanized, Mr. Noah Chasen. Um, is Katie Herman here tonight? Is Katie? There she is. The, Katie was uh, um, the editor who helped me finish the book in the last six months, which was an incredible, incredible task, and she did so much amazing work. So everybody, Katie, stand up, <laughs> give a little round of applause. Come on. And I also want to embarrass uh, another Helvetica star who I didn't know was going to be here, who just got off a plane from, where'd she come from? from Switzerland, uh, Lars Mueller, who published the Helvetica Homage to a Typeface book. You might remember him pointing to Helvetica on the street in the movie. Uh, and then also uh, my partner Jessica, who I couldn't have done the, the book without as well. So. Okay, so I thought it would be interesting to talk to <clears throat> this group of people who were in the three films about of kind of what has changed since the films come, came out um, in their different fields. So I guess we'll, let's start with the, uh, with Helvetica. For, actually, I want to know how have your feelings towards Helvetica changed, both the <laughs> typeface and the film in the eight years since it's been out? Paula? work. Is this on? Yeah, just okay. get closer. Okay. Um, I had already come around to liking Helvetica when you made the film. I didn't like Helvetica in the 70s, but uh, around the 90s, I, I actually like it. I still don't use it on general principle, but I, but I actually, in fact, <laughs> like it. I like New Rail, by the way. Nice combination of accidents in Helvetica. Uh, I think what changed, at least in terms of what I'm seeing in typography, is that when you made the movie, it was really, I think, the height of Helvetica love as a comeback from, you know, sort of neo-modernism in, in 
uh, as a period, um, you know, which I think was a direct response to postmodernism um, in the 90s. And so, you know, you were mid-decade of it. And what I notice now amongst younger designers is this complete desire for bespoke fonts and very intricate lettering. And there's a huge passion for that all over again. So the cycle's changed since mm -hmm. then. But I think, um, and Tobias and I have actually talked about this, I think what is changing about typography is the way we have to purchase it. In other words, if, you, if you're working for uh, an organization, they're purchasing the license for the type. So if they're buying a font for a massive corporation, it becomes very, very expensive and prohibitive to actually buy fonts that are known um, out of a type book. And that what I see as a trend is a lot of bespoke typography. So you not only create individual languages for organizations, but you actually get around the license purchase because it's actually cheaper to commission a type designer to design a bespoke font than to do the do the purchase on the license of the corporation is very big. That's huge. It's a very big difference. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all of those factors together, the sort of the, the date swing and the, the way you purchase it is changing the way we think about typography. Mm -hmm. Tobias, what do you think as a... Well, I think... Wait, wait, get on here. Uh, I think the... The film itself came out at a, at a at a really I don't know, sort of crucial moment where a uh, the sort of awareness of type design as an activity, you know, unto itself was I think just starting to get you know, some kind of recognition, and this film showed up and went out to every design school everywhere and is still being played every semester in every design school everywhere, um, and now everyone knows exactly what I do, um, uh, for better or worse. And uh, I, I, there have been times when I've been out walking the dog, just walking down Clinton Street in Brooklyn, and someone will be across the street and say, hey, you, Helvetica. <laughs> and like, Hi. Um, which is I don't know, a weird kind of celebrity I wasn't kind of <laughs> really was not prepared for, but um, I think what's changed in the in the field itself and and uh, is that, you know at about this point when the when you're making the film that the expectations of what a typeface can do were starting to increase uh, and the fonts are now expected to do far more than they ever have been. Um, and I think they're now recognized as something that can, you know, enable, uh, you know, the communication system either through its technical ability or its, you know, the particular shape of its, of its licensing arrangement or whatever, uh, and con conversely obstruct it as well hmm. uh, if it's, um, you know, a multinational corporation uh, realizes that they do really do need a font that has, you know, can set Cyrillic and Ukrainian and, you know, all these other languages as, as they go out into the rest of the world. So it's um, uh, sort of daunting to, uh, to be in a place where everyone expects all of this work to be done every time, but it's also, I think, kind of gratifying that the, the, the value of this work is starting to be understood. Hmm. And has the web, I mean, <clears throat> obviously there was type on the web in 2005 and 2006, but it seems like in the past 10 years, the way type is both delivered and embedded and um, sold, like, I mean, I, they're, you know, I'm buying like licenses, like web licenses for fonts now mm -hmm. that I want to use in my web page, and I wasn't, I wasn't doing that. Yeah, that, that was a that was a long time in coming, and uh, sort of went through its you know, kind of early stages very quickly. From this is something that we might be able to do one day. We can just barely do it. Most people can do it, and now everyone has to do it. Mm -hmm. That only took a couple of years. Um, to, to take place. So now it, you know, nobody bothers to ask if there's a web version of something because there has to be. Um, otherwise, it might as well not exist. Hmm. 
Um, this is for, uh, for David and, and Karen. When, when I watch Objectified, I was talking about this before, when I watch Objectified, <coughs> to me it seems like the most it's dated quicker just because all the stuff in it looks so I mean when Jonathan Ive pulls out his iPhone like three or something it looks like it's an antique um, and I guess that's kind of also what we was part of the conversation of the film is that was that sort of you know um, obsolescence and the idea of this the, the constant kind of churn of products but what, what do you think has has changed um, you know, in the eight years since we were filming that? Well, eight years ago was a really long time ago. <laughs> Till up your mind. And uh, I mean, that was back when we used to actually design physical products, you know, things that were made out of plastic and metal and you could touch them, you could use them, you could do things with them. And uh, today, actually, we're, we're not as, I mean, yeah, yeah, we do do physical products, but it's not so much the center of, of what, what we're doing. Um, the, you know, we, we designed, 20 some years ago, we designed that carrot peeler, you know, the one with the big fat rubber, black rubber handle on it. You that probably have. So good yeah, grips. Yeah, and, um, you know, and that's probably in the film, I, I, I talked a lot about um, things, that, you know, it's the, Pillar was really important, the product, but it was really about the experiences that enabled to help people that, you know, couldn't use their hands as, as, as well, be able to enjoy cooking and do things. Um, but when was the last time anybody peeled a carrot? They come in a little plastic bag, all peeled, <laughs> and they've been whittled down to a bite size, so you don't even have to cut them up. <laughs> and, uh, I, I mean, that, uh, it's kind of an extreme example of that when, you, when we think about products and the experience around that product or what it enables, you really have to think beyond the product itself. Uh, but what are the other things that can enable the experience, you know, somebody can peel the carrots for you. Uh, you know, you have a telephone in your pocket that you may cherish the object, it's nice, but it's what it does. You know, one time we thought, well, okay, it's a nice object, but it's got to have cool apps on it. And then we thought, well, maybe they should be, they should work, they should be easier to use. And, and now it really isn't about the phone, it isn't about the cool apps, it isn't about how easy they are to use, because we assume all of that, we expect it. It's really what the services are, that it, what it's doing for us, what the services are that it's bringing to us. And uh, I think that's how our, you know, our business has really evolved and really thinking about helping our clients navigate this, uh, this new landscape where it's thinking beyond the physical and what's the entire experience and how can we, how can we make that better. Karen? I don't, you know, when I, when I read the subject, uh, or the tenet of this conversation, I thought, you know, on one hand, eight years is a long time ago, and on the other hand, it's like yesterday. Right? And why I say that is because um, the objects, that film, some of the objects, if they were in the sector of high technology, of course, they look very dated. Because the perversity of high technology in a strange way is, is that it will de we know it will dematerialize to nothing, right? And it's getting closer and closer and closer to that point. So admittingly, to design a physical object, and I'm, I just did, we're doing a mobile phone right now in Israel, and a bunch of these tech objects, I think they're, they're really a tedious kind of um, project because they, uh, it's, it's not, the physical, the physicality is, is dematerialized so much that at least as an industrial designer, you have very, very little to do. It, to the point where, if I was very honest, I would just say, I don't really need the object, I just need a screen, right? So, and just not to segue, but you know, I'm, I was just, at, I just designed a, a media lab in Queen's University in Canada, and they already just showed me while I was working on the project, which is now almost two years ago, flexible um, touchpad, transparent, you know, which is beautiful. And it's, so it's a working prototype sitting there for two years, so we know what's gonna happen, right? So we don't need, so in regards to what you're saying, and then we know that the kind of, that's the user interface and everything, which actually goes more to the Helvetica film end of it, is that all this interface on these phones and everything are relatively pathetic because the whole thing is so two-dimensional, but yet what's changed in this last eight years is the living in this perpetual three-dimensional 
virtual landscape, or it could be far more three-dimensional. In turn, what I, what I call kind of uh, fourth dimensional, which is really that just to, why I'm saying that is because we designed, for the history of humanity, we designed in 2D ever since we figured out one-point perspective during the Renaissance. So the 2D, we shaped, we, we designed everything in 2D and we ended up creating now the world we live in. This 3D world this actually came from triangles and squares and, and uh, T-squares and all that, right? But the reality is now is last, since that film, probably before that, we have more or less only designed in 3D. And in turn, I think when you only design in 3D and you don't look at the world anymore, it's plan, section, elevation, front view, bottom, top, you will shape a fourth dimensional world. And that fourth dimensional world is time, which is human experience, which is making a better world, a more experiential world, which I think is exactly, I'm just going about it in a very complex round way of exactly what he said in a, in a couple of sentences, <laughs> is this notion of <laughs> that design is starting to shape a real great human experience. That it's not anymore just to, to, to fetishize an object, right? like, oh wow, look at that, beautiful. Mm -hmm. But to really like live every day, where if you have objects in your lives, which by the way, I think we'll still have a lot of physical things, like chairs and these objects that we, low-tech objects will always be around, but they gotta kind of get up to speed with this digital age, with this, and be phenomenally beautiful, experiential, and seamless, and comfortable, and, and inspiring, and, you know, and so that film's kind of full. Of, when you look at it, you, you, it's funny because a lot of people were interviewed in it too. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing them personally, but there's a hell of a lot of nostalgia in there about my old briefcase or my old typewriter or my old, you know, isn't there an old camera, and all that sort of stuff. I think we're kind of finally, finally starting to let that stuff go because we know that that's the analog world which the majority of us now do not really almost exist in anymore and youth culture, it's definitely in the digital age, not in the analog age anymore. But don't you think sometimes it's about, it's about process? Because you still sketch a lot of ideas, and, and that's a I very don't give a shit about process. Yeah. You but do you, do you process sketch Process is yourself? bullshit. At the end of the day, <laughs> think about it. You've got a world with seven billion people. You have one billion cars on the street. You have cities that need to be designed. There's so much. It's a complex world we created. At the end of the day, process is just something that's, how can I say, incestuous. It's about us going, ooh, process. Uh, uh. You know, but at the end of the day, as a consumer, you know, you, tomorrow you go out and buy a car. That car not only should be phenomenal, not only should it be electric, not only should it fly or whatever it does, it should really like bring you a phenomenal, positive, safe, comfortable experience. That's all. And we're that liaison in between there where we're trying to, we try to make that happen, I think, or at least I try to make that happen. And I've got to deal with some, you know, hard-nosed, miserable, marketing-driven manufacturers or somebody like that, pardon me, and, uh, and make that happen, you know? <laughs> so what does process mean in all that? Doesn't well, you're still creating these things in, in a very, I mean, I, you still draw, right? You draw your... I draw every day. You draw every day. You sketch pages thing. on an iPad. And that's a two-dimensional... It's not because I have a software now on my iPad that I, when I sketch, I, if I push harder, I can go into perspective. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I can draw in 3D like that. And I draw with fingers now. I am like, I barely pick up a pencil or a marker or a pen. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, those things change. That's only, that's, those are only tools, just tools. Yeah, but it's the mind. You're right. The process is, is, is your right brain. Although that's been denounced now, right? Left and right, right are not really different anymore. Did you read that? Mm -hmm. uh, um, anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Next film. <laughs> Next yeah. film. Well, because we were saying before, Noah and I were talking before, and Noah, you thought that of any of these fields, the design of cities is probably the least, the, or the slowest to change. Yeah, well, I mean, on one hand, it's, it's the most recent film, so le less has changed, and in five then years. there's just the glacial change of yeah. cities in general. But as I was listening to everybody else, I was thinking to myself, you know, we have the digitization of fonts. We have the um, gradual disintegration and dematerialization of the the real, the authentic, the you know, the experience. And cities, I think, in a way, are moving in the opposite direction. That there was a lot. There was a prolonged period of discussion about spaces of flows and um, you know cities of information and cities of bits and things like that but what's ended up happening 
is uh, and ended up, I mean, as if something has concluded, you know, and we're still very much in the process of this, but I feel as if the, the city has remained the last refuge of the real, in a sense, and even though we have the disnification of Times Square, let's say, or, um, you know, these, these um, interstitial spaces of movement of airports and things like that, that cities have become places where, for example, a lot of tech companies are now moving to precisely so that they can have that interpersonal connection that you can't do through televisual means. Mm -hmm. And insofar as that's the case, you see cities starting to concretize themselves in a way, uh, you know, with, based on needs that they didn't have necessarily before, but at the same time very enduring ones, which are about community and about collectivity and collaboration. And, I, you know, I, I just, I, I think that there's some irony to the fact that the, the city of all things would be the one that would ultimately be the container for, you know, the, the grounding mechanism for all of this other dematerialization that's happening. Hmm. Um, you teach at <clears throat> Columbia. How about the way it is urban design being taught differently now? Is it, has it changed the way... Yeah, like again, level now is it's only a few years after the fifth. I mean, I mean, in general. Yeah, I mean, it, since I've been teaching, and, and I'm a historian, not a practitioner, so I feel a little bit impoverished with all of these tremendous figures here because I just write about and teach about this stuff as opposed to actually making things. Um, but uh, I would say, I mean, first of all, just the mention of uh, Helvetica being shown in design schools, I'll say also that every year when the new class of urban design master students comes in, at least one, usually about five of them, come up to me and say, um, I have a question for you. Were you in a film? <laughs> you know, they, and, uh, and I say, yes, I was. Uh, also, a celebrity that I, I mean, of a very, very minimal sort that I never expected. Uh, but it's definitely being shown a lot, and it's, I know it's being shown in Columbia every year. Um, one of the things that I think has changed in terms of the teaching of urban design, which is also having an impact on the way that cities are being designed, the way urban designers, I mean the people who are graduating from the program are working, is really in a more collaborative fashion. I mean in the same way that the city is meant to, or is, is serving as a, uh, an incubator for a lot of different creative minds coming together and having proximity to one another, the whole process of urban design is also something that uh, is, is happening on a more collaborative level, that it's not simply an extension of architectural practice, which is what, I mean, it's a relatively new profession, urban design, as, an, as a singular entity. 1956 is when it was um, really first named as a discipline uh, that was distinct from architecture. Um, and the way that it's taught now, I, uh, I, I see it increasingly working towards a more collaborative process and also a more research-based process where you know, rather than simply having that, you know, divinely inspired design come to you in the middle of, you know, a, 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 a um, spastic fit of, of <laughs> whatever. Um, <laughs> that, of creativity. It happens Thank you. all the time, you, by the way. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> I've never unfortunately experienced that. But, constant, um, constant spasms. Really? <laughs> You know, I, can, I, can I say something about that? Yeah. Is it, is it uh, you should probably do more documentaries and professions that are completely misunderstood. Mm. Like, yeah. it, it happened the same with industrial design too. I mean, you know, I remember sitting on a plane, it's 1979 or 81 or something, and I had this like nice project. And I, oh, no, no, I was, I was going off to, do, actually it's 82. I was going off to do my master's in, uh, in Milan. And somebody asked me beside me, you know, like, so, you know, what do you do? And I said, oh, I graduated in industrial design. And I had no idea. And the first thing you got was, oh, that you design factories, right? Which, yeah. <laughs> and, and it, you know, this loss. And then, you know, so many years later, now it's 1995, and I'm sitting on a plane, and now I get to fly business. And I'm in business class, and there's a guy sitting beside me, and he's like some rich guy, and he told me, started telling me, bragging that he owns 12% of Pfizer. You know, it's like, good for you. And, um, and I said, do you have any Viagra on you? And, uh, and, and he, he actually... Um, picks up an Emporium magazine and looks through it all of these products and says, you know, I own every product in here. 
<laughs> said, good for you. And he, I said, what's your favorite product? He said, you know, the light bulb, when you go like that, it goes on and off. With the clapper. And, and when I told him industrial design, he said, oh, is that the kind of stuff you do? So it's kind of a little misunderstood. He said, what are you working on? And I said, I'm working on a, actually on a waste basket. It was like the Garbo can I did for Umbro, a God knows when, 95. And uh, he laughed for the entire rest of the trip. Like, <laughs> but I spend my life devoted to designing a garbage can. Can you think about that? And I got off the plane kind of really disillusioned about my profession. You know? So <laughs> now, no, I'm serious. And now, you know, product design has become this public subject. Everybody I meet in the world has seen that film. So congratulations, Gary. I just want to say, brilliant, you know. Thanks. And because uh, you ex you expose very creative fields that, that are phenomenally involved and complex, actually. And we take a lot of this for granted. I mean, the majority of us take the physical world, at least in industrial design, for granted. All these beautiful products around you that are high performing and amazing, actually. And and now the quality and how inexpensive things are, you know, it's it's. It's interesting because like, my, you know, um, uh, the reason that I made the films was I was just really wanted to know more about these different fields and making a film just seemed like a good way to go about, um, you know, exploring them and learning more. It's, I, I really had no idea, I, I had no idea that there were such things as like, you know, uh, like that colleges or art schools would buy copies of the film and show them in class, and that was a thing. I, I had produced music documentaries before I made Helvetica, so I didn't even know that that was a, you know, that existed, <laughs> that it could be. And when I was making the film, I had I never thought, oh, this is going to be a great teaching aid for first year design school uh, mm -hmm. professors. But um, but it's interesting how that that of, of course it ends up being like something that 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 um that could all the films could could be used as that. But it wasn't it wasn't something that I thought about at all in the least when I was when I was making them. I didn't even know that that was a. <laughs> that was a, an audience for the uh, for the films. Um, I kind of feel like we're in like this mashup of all three films, which is really making me nostalgic. Uh, uh, um, but uh, I, I'd like to invite all of you to uh, join in the the mashup. And uh, if you have any questions for any myself or any of the panelists, uh, uh, part part of the joy of, of, of uh, calling through these interviews is seeing uh, the process by which you're starting to discover the storyline of, of the film, uh, like, like the different questions you ask, um, and, and almost seeing the, the like 20 different movies that could be contained within uh, within each of these. And I was wondering if you um, had any uh, had any thoughts about uh, making the footage open source so that other people could put together their own uh, versions. <laughs> wow. Um, I hadn't thought about that. But it was interesting when we first um, started uh, editing the book and arranging the sections, my, my first impulse was, oh, we'll just kind of order the interviews in the order that they appear in the film, so you get kind of the same experience of the, of the film, but in the, of course, the interviews. And we did that for Helvetica, and it didn't make any sense at all, because I was so much a part of the conversation, and I was referring to things that hadn't happened yet, or had already happened, and it, it just made more sense to do it chronologically, um, from the first interview I did with Massimo Vignelli to the very last interview in, in, in Urbanized. Um, and I think you do kind of see, because I have no idea what I'm doing when I start the film, I'm, I'm kind of diving in and you know, hoping that they'll, they're the, a story or some sort of arc or a way to organize the film will kind of emerge. And, and you do, when you're reading it, you start to see it, because I'm learning more about the subject as I'm going along. And each interview kind of informs the next interview and the next one. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting when we put it all together is you really do see how a documentary is a design too. It's it's very constructed. Um, I mean, all of these people up on the panel and everyone in the films are very eloquent and very brilliant. And um, but. If you read the book, you see how you know we might have taken a sentence from this paragraph, and then you know, 30 minutes later, another sentence, and when we put them together in the film, it sounds it, it works. Um, so we, we're not like Frankensteining people's words together, um, but uh, but there is you get to see a little bit of that of that process too by um, by reading the raw the raw text. But yeah, the open source t idea, I don't know. I guess you could do it in the in text form. <laughs> Other questions? Do we abandon the mic, Michael? Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to turn it off. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, sort of off of 
that statement, did you ever, when you went into filming any of the movies, I guess Helvetica more so, because it was the first one, probably a little bit more unknown, did you hit a certain point at during one of the interviews that it sort of just changed paths of like what's going to happen, like how, what the overall like story can be told? Um, I think with, with Helvetica, I mean, I, I had been kind of a self-taught graphic designer. I got a Macintosh in 1987 and was playing around with fonts and design, you know, for, for many years. Um, and I was reading design, graphic design magazines like Emma Gray and, you know, saw Lars's book uh, on Helvetica. So that was the one that I knew the most about, I guess, going in. I, I knew who the people were. I hadn't met them, but I you know, knew about the subject matter, at least. And Helvetica also kind of had a little bit more of a conventional arc to it, since it was the 50 years, and you know, someone made it, and the use, and everything. Um, I think it was the other films, but definitely objectified, that, that, that uh, I, but I, I, could, I could say that there was a turning point in almost every single interview, because I went in really not knowing anything, and coming out and talking to you know someone like Karim uh, or Johnny, I've um, it, every every time it, it it shifted the direction of the next conversation, and it shifted kind of in my head how I was kind of editing the film, kind of as I go along. Um, so much of a documentary is made in the in the editing room. I mean, with each of these films, we had you know um, just. 20, 30, 40 hours of conversations that you lay it all out in the in the edit room and you start to see the things that connect and the commonalities um, and how we arrange the films and, um, you know, the order of the interviews. All that stuff just kind of happens by, by trial and error, looking at it, you know, over and over again and kind of trying to visualize what would, what would work. So, um, yeah, definitely in, in, in objectified and, and also in urbanized. I mean, I was learning so much with every with every interview. I mean, I kind of dove into those subjects, and uh, uh, so it changed, you know, every day it would change. I do a lot of, like, editing in my head, basically. Just kind of thinking, like, if I'm watching this thing on the screen, like, what's the best or most interesting way for it to unfold? Um, and at, cer at a certain point, it gets out of my head and it's on screen and we can actually try playing things, but they it always starts, in my in my head, I can just sort of start watching the the kind of movie, or just get an idea of what the movie could be like, and then I try to kind of go out and and do it. I've 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 often said like I'm the most excited about the idea for the film the day that I have it, and then after that it's just kind of like a slow grind through like you know years of travel and money and the work, um, and if I could just kind of press record and spit it out, um, you know, it would be totally different than what the film end up being because part of why the films ended up the way they are is the process, is meeting all of these people, is the conversations and the travel and everything. Um, but uh, I'm just, I'm impatient. Like when I, when I have an idea for the film, like God, why can't I watch a film about font? You know, I want to watch a film about Helvetica and it's not out there and then you just got to roll up your sleeves and, and kind of go do it. So, uh, uh, go ahead. How did you prepare for each interview? How did I prepare for each interview? Um, it, it depended on the on the on the person. Um, I think most of the times I tried to keep the preparation to a minimum because I, I think I wanted to be learning and discovering um, and responding to the other person's story in real time and not be you know some ultimate authority on you know Karen Rashid. Um, you know, the other thing is like I don't I don't prepare questions. That's the other the other uh, um, thing I, I I try maybe scribble down a few topics. But if you have a long list of questions, I think it starts turning it into an interview and not uh, an actual conversation. Um, and I was learning as much from the person, you know. Um, so I like that. I, I like to let the conversation sort of flow and go off on tangents. And it's funny the thing if you kind of read in the book too, you kind of see the. You know, the tangents we go down, um, and, and for me, a lot of times it's about kind of getting everybody, you know, comfortable and talk, talking and engaged. I mean, um, you know, all of these people get interviewed a lot. It's a weird situation. I'm coming in in the middle of the workday and setting up cameras and microphones and all this kind of stuff. So, whatever I can do to kind of 
you know, help them to kind of forget that <laughs> this is a, an interview. Um, and I think like the, the strict questions is, is one way to kind of kind of do that. But we did have roles. We had you had roles. Oh, we all had roles. In I mean, the in the film. I mean, if you look at Helvetica, it's a complete arc. People are selected very specifically. You knew what you were going to get. <laughs> well, not exactly what I was going to get. I had an idea. In Helvetica, definitely, I, I think I had, a, had an idea what I was going to get. But there was a lot of people that I had <coughs> sort of blew me away um, or scared the shit out of me. Um, <laughs> Eric Speakerman. <laughs> but... Uh, no, but that was a perfect historical arc. <laughs> yeah, well, again, the Helvetica was more of a, of a chronological structure, um, whereas the other films, uh, you know, I li like I, I like to think that um, Helvetica, it sort of explores this whole world of creativity behind this seemingly one small thing, and the other um, films are almost kind of the opposite. They look at this whole world of creativity and find the, like, one kind of thread, or if it's the thinking, or, um, you know, whatever it is behind it that connects at all so um, so yeah they're different they're definitely different different structures good I think it's interesting the room we're in with these preserved rare books and the conversation we're having about how tangible items are oh uh, yeah so I was mm. just occurred to me how you guys think about your work and how it's being preserved as technology you know, something that's less tangible Huh. Paula? Well, first of all, I still peel carrots, so um, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to disappoint anybody in the room. As a matter of fact, those things in the bag are crap, they and are. you don't you don't go near them. You get the long, little, thin ones; they're delicious. You know, put them in the. Um, um, the I've been running. I've been having this weird experience of running back up against my past. I mean, I had uh, uh, MoMA suddenly got interested in the record covers that I did in the 70s and I started collecting them and I had to buy them back on eBay. <laughs> but, I, I, but they're out there and a lot of them were in great shape. And it was, it was sort of amazing that this stuff is around. I don't think it, it disappears. I think it lessens in a way. But that, that there are things that are always ephemeral and then there are things that are indelible. And the indelibility of something I think has to do with memory that if you, you know, you can't, you can say that everybody is like this, but you can't take away somebody's memory about how they experience something, and that's what makes it lasting. And that what I find in, um, particularly as a graphic designer, that when people want things that I've designed, and I try to find out why they want that particular object or thing, it has to do with their experience, like if it's a public theater poster, they'll say, oh, I lived across the street from that when I first moved to New York City. And you can't take that away. That's not a disappearing object anymore because it is whatever emotional connection you made to that at the time. And then things that you think are designed forever can be very fleeting. You know, there's no rhyme or reason. But I, 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 I find that the notion that it all is disappearing is, is a little bit facile. Also, to this point, to the, to the point of living in this land. Uh, it's a very terrific um, thing on NPR about three weeks ago where they were talking about boredom and how terrific boredom is for creativity because it's that period where you're really in subconscious land and that, that if you are you know sitting in a taxi cab and stuck in traffic and looking out the window and drooling, you're likely to get a terrific idea. And if you're doing this, you're probably not going to because you're absorbed in this other thing that you're conscious about and it doesn't leave you that space. So I think there'll be a reassessment to a degree of how you actually use the time. And it, it isn't, sometimes you can navigate to where you want to go without actually looking at your iPhone. You can sort of figure it out, but sometimes by the socioeconomic conditions of what's around you outside. I don't think it disappears. No, I just think that uh, you know I agree that it's the experience. It's what's remembered, and if an object is part of that experience, you remember it. Uh, if it isn't really an important part of that experience, then yeah, it disappears, and it should. <laughs> you know, I I I think it's uh, 
pers personally, I, I, I can't do what I do and work the way I work and think the way I think if I'm going to be worried about my immortal destiny at all. I mean, it's, it's a very, for me, it's a very perverse, almost macabre-like way to even like, think about things, meaning that um, whether I end up on these shelves, you know, 100 years from now or something like that, I don't think there'll be, oh, I shouldn't say that, sorry. I don't, know, I don't, think, I don't think books are going to be around, but, um, <laughs> but um, sorry to say that in this shop. I mean, it's, it's a re there's a reality. I mean, I was, tell I, was, I was on one hand kind of choking, but there's a truth that when I did my first book, which is 15 years ago, I was so thrilled to do it. I couldn't wait to do it. And I was with Rizzoli, and they paid me a lot of money to do it. And then I did my second book with Tashin. They paid me a little bit less money. Then I did a third book with Rizzoli, even less money. The next one, less money. And then I just finished a huge monograph in the Chinese press, and I, the deal was I had to buy back 500 or 1,000 books or something. So, so that's the book business, anyway. But that's, that's besides the point. The, the idea is, I think, and this is, comes up in design a lot, and I'm not sure, you know, it probably happens in every design field, is this fear that you're not doing something that's going to last. So you hear all these words attached to it, like, we don't want it to be too trendy, or we don't want it to be this or that. But the reality is, very little lasts anyway, firstly. But second of all, if you look at the most prolific and most pivotal work in history, it was for that moment. It made total sense about the time in which people live. Generally, it was technologically driven, and it was right on for the time. Meaning you can't even go into the design process thinking you're going to design something that's going to last. And I will even have clients who will say to me, oh, but we want to do something a little, you know, a little more classic. And I'm thinking to myself, what the hell does that mean? Do you know? So I'm serious, because are they talking about it from a style point of view? Because as far as I'm concerned, that's what history, it's a denotation of styles. So that's how we, we actually chrono chronologized, is that the word? Our entire history through styles, right? So are they talking about classicism? Are they talking about neoclassicism? Are they talking about classic meaning that they want the table rectangle because that's modernism and that's kind of more accepted? What, 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 is, what are they after? You know? <coughs> Their fear is they're going to build something that five years from now nobody wants. You know, in every hotel I do, and now in the buildings I'm doing, there's this constant ongoing fear from people. The reality is, when we used to go to a Morris Lapidus hotel that you know, sat around for 30, 40 years, that no longer exists. You know, so when you hear like, oh, the Royalton that Philip Stark did in 1989, they're going to redo it, and they turn the whole interior and ripped it all out, and everybody's upset for a moment. It's gone. The reality is now interiors are probably lasting seven, eight years on average. You know, it's amazing how fast things are moving. So the reality is you can't, as a creative, at least for me, as a creative person, I cannot sit and get caught up with worrying about the le length or the longevity of my work, and even more so, the longevity of my being at all. Yeah, you know, you know. Let, let's talk, if, if you don't mind, for a second. Um, Eames, there's a lot of reasons why those chairs are around now. You know, uh, number one was that they, the, the intent at that time was a kind of frugal, using mass production methods to create some sort of frugal, well-priced seating. Although, interestingly enough, it was very, they were very expensive in the 1950s and 60s. Very expensive. The reality is now is we can produce them very inexpensively. So it kind of makes sense at this point now. Like, in other words, production has moved to the point where those chairs are made robotically. The base is the way they're done. They're practically hands off. You can make them for, you know, and there are $39 versions, lots of them and all that. Um, I do a lot of work in China and I see kind of the, the movement of China and the movement of, of just basically robotics in general, that we're starting to produce amazing things with, for low price point, you know. So in regards to, you know, that there are certain objects that may and may not continue and last, like 
Ganeem's chair. But the process of going into designing, when Charles Eames worked on those chairs, I'm sure the last thing he thought about is that there's going to be this fabulous mid-century American revivalism taking place that Europe is going to, you know, copy, basically. I doubt, I doubt he thought that. He was working at that moment in time, working with the best technology he could, doing things that he felt were, you know, designed to meet the criteria of that moment. And in turn, that object prevailed. And, and, and if you look at the history, if you want to talk about design, is if you look at the Alvar Aalto chairs of bent plywood, that was done because he saw sewage pipe done in bent plywood tubes and basically took that idea. Mark Stamm and Marcel Brouwer and Mies, they saw there was a bicycle factory in East Berlin. They saw the way they were bending bicycle bars and thought, oh, we can maybe make a chair that way. So you can go along the history, at least for design in a way. And every product was up because there was a new technology associated with it. I think that you really can't intentionally uh, design something to be classic. It, it becomes timeless if it retains meaning over a long period of time or over generations. And we can't predict what will retain meaning in the future. It's like that's really up to you and society at the state in the future. I think it's like I think just typefaces and architecture are also two fields that are so heavily about drawing on the cla the classic uh, you know proportions of a typeface or a building. I don't, I don't think anything is timeless. I think everything exists in its time, and you don't have any control over what becomes iconic. So that that's um, that's what's bizarre about it, and that even when you when you look at things that you're told are timeless in school, if you analyze them, you find, of course, you can, you can equate it to the time. Well, I, I think there are certainly, in, in typeface design, there's certainly degrees of longevity, but there, you know, as, um, as we were just saying, the, the, it's not always up to us. Actually, I think very little of it is up to us. It, it will depend on how this is how this is received and also how it's promoted. Um, you know, Helvetica, uh, you know, has has these these great qualities and it's really well drawn and well thought out. It was also massively promoted um, and also got another extra huge boost for you know from being shipped with every Macintosh. Um, so it's. Um, you know, it, it's it's not just you know the quality of the thing itself. It's it's the the audience that receives it and the the you know, system that that promotes it as well, and none of which can be predicted, really. The cor corollary in architecture. Well, I was just thinking when Paula mentioned um, memory, which I think is obviously sort of haunting this whole conversation here, that <coughs> in the room. And the room, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, uh, that uh, the city, in a lot of ways, and not to be too facile about a definition of a city, because of course there are many different things, but a city is, in many ways, the the most exquisite repository for memory. I mean, even when you mentioned uh, a, a poster for the public theater, and you say, "Oh, I remember." where I was and when I was, and you think about the public theater, maybe you're not even in New York City, maybe you're not even in the East Village, but you're projecting yourself back to that particular spatial experience, you know, and whether we're talking about built spaces or unbuilt spaces, they have um, this layered value, this, you know, palimpsestic value of different experiences that get mm -hmm. poured on top of them. and. Um, and so the idea of timelessness, I mean, I'm just thinking about that, I think I feel very much the way the other panelists do, that it's certainly not something that you can anticipate, and it's also not a universal, you know? Somebody can say, I, I mean, I was just reading about a guy who, speaking of design, where did I come across this? I can't remember. Is it, uh, it's a hand, ba it's a bag, like a leather satchel, and he fa some guy found it at a flea market, and he said, you know, I, why can't we make, did anybody see this? Where did I see? I can't remember. Uh, and, and he said, why can't I make this, but make it all, you know, with, you, using, using artisan materials and old school techniques. And he was able to replicate it because he was getting all these compliments on this 
timeless bag, I guess. So he replicated it, and much like the Eames, it costs $10,000. <laughs> I mean, who's going to buy that bag? You know, it's not going to become a timeless item in the sense of a, a, a typeface or a, a, a trash can, which is going to be much more useful on the larger scale. So, I, you know, I think this idea of, of timelessness is, um, is always relative. So, so the question is, what school is this? And, and, who's, <laughs> and who's your faculty? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that, by the way. <laughs> I actually travel from outside of New York City. I don't know where to, to get here. From where? I'm actually, um, I'm actually traveling from work, so I'm doing a project. But I was from Vancouver. Ah. And you went where, Emily Carr? Is that where you went? Where's uh, you? No, I'm from New York. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, probably not. <laughs> you would know do you want to pay him a visit and <laughs> no. go lecture? <laughs> I mean, they need they need you, Karen. Uh, we have time for one more question, and it is going to be that person. Yes. Um, yep. Go ahead. Wonderful. Uh, for the panelists, uh, you know, part of what the movie has done, I think, is help raise the profile of design. And I'm curious to what your uh, experience has been with how your work has been evaluated. Have you noticed changes? in what people expect from, from your work, or maybe what you expect from your work uh, now that people understand what you do to some degree and people are stopping you in the street. I guess I'm going. Yeah. Um, are you handing that to me, or no? Okay. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Oh, okay. I'm gonna jump out. I have to go. I'm sorry. It's my daughter's two-year-old uh, birthday today, oh. um, so I, I really gotta go because I'm gonna right. be keeping her up. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks, everybody. So, I'm sorry. I think a lot of things made people more conscious of graphic design, though I, it, it was nice getting followed in an airport, but, but I have to say that, <laughs> that, that didn't, I don't think the film actually did much in, in terms of a client's understanding of it. What I think did a lot for clients is Target, Martha Stewart, Apple, um, Google, sort of the, the, the act of actually picking your own fonts on your computer. I mean, all of that changed the way people begin to understand the profession, and it raised, it raised the bar and made life easier in the States because you could compare something that was designed at a certain level to something that wasn't designed at all at a certain level, and that, that, that really was great for design and then everything else on top of its gravy. But it gets better all the time. It's a great time to be a designer. Yeah, I would think I have to spend far less effort explaining what I do. I think this, uh, and there were sort of stages of a conversation where I would have to explain either to a client or to anybody else what I do. Uh, you know, and I have to field the, you know, are there enough typefaces in the world question. Um, it always comes up. Um, and now, now I, I get to skip over that. Uh, I, I don't have to explain that anymore. I can sort of cut to the chase of what this problem, you know, for the client is and how typo typography can solve it or, or which parts are actually not typographic and they actually have to do with something else. Um, so it's, it's, it's made the conversations with, with clients much more, uh, uh, I don't know, direct or efficient. I got a, right after the film, I got a lot of emails. Uh, people wanted to know what kind of watch I had and where to buy it. <laughs> but I think it was a prominently shown in large. Wow, I don't even remember <laughs> but, that but, but I think the biggest, you know, I don't think I've talked to a student since then that hasn't seen all the films. And I think that's really remarkable. Hmm? No, you already. Well, I had said the same thing, but I, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Your stardom. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, yeah, I, as I said at the very beginning of when I was talking, I, you know, the change that happens in, on, on an urban level is so slow that it's 
hard to imagine that you're going to see immediate impacts. But I will say that um, that the the kind of ethos of a, a greater awareness, not just by designers but by the larger public, is something that. Um, and not to take anything away from the film, which I obviously thought was fantastic, uh, but even beyond the film itself, I feel like it came at a, at a really wonderful moment when this kind of collaborative, maybe more participatory ethos was starting to be taught in schools and then practiced by graduates. And um, you know, I, I, I think a lot of the voices in the film, whether by design or whether it happened spontaneously, just by virtue of what was going on, you know, really reinforced that. Mm -hmm. And that was great. Mm -hmm. Paul, you got another? Yeah, there's one thing I think the film really changed. And I think that that was um, sort of the understanding about everybody else's profession. Like there's more interdisciplinary behavior yeah. as a result of the film because there are three of them and you start to to watch them and absorb who does what and that's fantastic that i think is is a, a great outcome of it um as a filmmaker i think that um e even i've seen in the time that i've been making films how the i mean I think the process and and just the, the 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 bar to entry of making a documentary has, you know, lowered um, so much just because the technology is so much more um, accessible now. I mean, your iPhone has better video quality than the camera that we shot Helvetica on. <laughs> I'm seriously, it actually can do a lot. The, the six can do a lot more than than our camera did at the time, um, and. You know, I, I, I think it's, I'm, what I'm really, um, you know, excited and glad about is that there were just no, I mean, part of the reason I made Helvetica was I just could, I just wanted to watch films about graphic design and type and there was nothing. Um, and post uh, that film coming out, we, I mean, it kind of showed that there was an audience for films about design. And I think we've all been, um, you know the recipients of that uh, since that there have been you know many many more documentaries about design coming out and in all types of disciplines, which has been the very very cool um, you know byproduct of, of releasing these films. It's just getting I get to watch more films too. We all get to watch more films, and that's it's been amazing. But um, you know I see. It's interesting that we had this conversation in Helvetica too. Just like when the tools become accessible, you know, you see a lot more work up up there. And I see beautiful, stunning, you know, videos up on on Vimeo and stuff. But a lot of times, it's still you don't see the um, the the imagine like the, the the concept isn't there or the story or the the you know, things can look really very very nice and very professional but there's still not um that that uh i don't know that kind of creative drive that 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 you know makes it engaging so there's still you know people that are making incredible films um and i think that that the changes in technology across design and filmmaking and all these disciplines have made it so that somebody who is just born to do this or, or is going to be incredibly talented now can get in. We're much more, um, yeah, there's a wider net that can be cast to find great, great artists uh, in all these, um, all these disciplines. So um, that's kind of what I have seen. So um, thanks again, everybody, for coming out. Thank you to the panelists and to Scram for having us. And um, yeah, take care.